It's astounding. There really could be life on Mars. This week, NASA reported there was clear evidence that parts of the red planet were once drenched with water, certainly enough to support life. That's just one of the wonders beamed back to Earth, thanks to the American rovers which landed on Mars in January. And thanks also to our scientist at the dish at Tidbinbilla. The latest discovery is good news for President Bush too. His dream of a manned mission now seems just a little more feasible. So, someday soon, there could be life on Mars after all. Human life. Is there anybody out there? It's a cold, bleak and desolate place. But right now, Mars is hot. This barren planet could turn science fiction into fact by answering the ultimate question, is there life out there? And given the fact that we live in a universe that is millions and billions of stars, and we're in a galaxy that frankly, we're one of the smaller stars, we're not even in downtown Milky Way, we're on the periphery, way on the edge. We're out in the burbs. We're in the burbs, in this galaxy alone. Forget about in this universe. They may look like dune buggies, but by safely landing the rovers, Spirit and Opportunity on Mars, NASA has revolutionized space exploration, sending back crystal clear close-ups never before seen by a human eye. And you would not have been able to do it without a rover. Oh, no, this. absolutely. I mean, imagine if you're a, 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 an explorer, a field geologist, and somebody takes you to some wonderful place that nobody's ever been to before, and then they nail your boots to the ground. How dreadful. You've got to be able to move. you just <laughs> got to be able to move. Steve Squires is the principal investigator on NASA's project, the head scientist behind these wheels on Mars. This gizmo here, this is called the RAT, which stands for Rock Abrasion Tool. Um, when you see a geologist, they've got a big rock hammer and they use it for breaking rocks open. Well, instead of breaking rocks open, what we do is we can grind away the outer surface of a rock, sort of opening a window into the interior of the rock that the other instruments can look at. The key is water. The key is liquid water. The things that you need for life, you need some kind of energy. Sunlight will do just fine. You need the, what's called the biogenic elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, the stuff that life is made of. And then you need water. When you take a look at some of these photos, and let's do that now, uh, to me it seems like you don't even need to get off the plane. <laughs> this mission to Mars has rekindled public interest, if not a little skepticism in space exploration. In every forest of rocks there, there are clues. Whether Mars ever, ever could have been hospitable to life and whether those clues are lurking right. in those rocks. Well, I can tell you from taking a look at it, the answer is no. True, Mars may look like the back blocks of Cuba Pedi, but the fact that NASA is there at all is an extraordinary achievement. Because let's face it, not a lot of Mars projects have worked. Two thirds of them have failed. Two thirds of them have been failures historically. Mars is a very tough place to do business. It's very unforgiving. The rovers were launched in the middle of one of NASA's worst years on record. The space shuttle Columbia had exploded just months earlier killing all seven astronauts on board. Critics were questioning NASA's role, its very existence. So for NASA's boss, Sean O'Keefe, the stakes were huge. I mean, there's, there's no question. It, this, is, this is an agency in its 45 years has always been defined by its great triumphs and its great failures and, and, and tragedies. Uh, and every time, if you look through the annals of history, every time there's been a great triumph, it has been just overwhelming, where everybody says, my goodness, this is the most extraordinary bunch of people the world has ever seen. And when tragedies occur, we are you know, pariah. The trip to Mars takes seven months. And like a giant slingshot fired from Earth 160 million kilometres away, Rover had to hit Mars with pinpoint accuracy. Travelling 20 times faster than a speeding bullet, there was no margin for error on the night of the landing. Everyone was standing by for news Rover had survived the trip. 
But it was not Mars NASA was sweating on for the news, it was Australia. Which brings us to Tidbin Billa, just outside of Canberra, home to one of only three deep space tracking networks in the world. This is the biggest dish in the Southern Hemisphere and a vital link in NASA's mission on Mars. It's the middleman in the conversations between NASA and Mars. And without this, mission control could not send commands or receive information. And at no time has our role been more critical than during what scientists have called the six minutes of terror, when the first of the rovers was hurtling towards Mars. Terror would not be too strong a word. You hit the top of the Martian atmosphere going 25 times the speed of sound, and six minutes later, you're, you're down on the surface. It's, it's quite a ride. And the most critical point is when the airbags hit the ground. Because that's the part where if the velocities are too great, either in the vertical direction or the horizontal direction, and you hit rocks that are bigger than you expected, that's the point where things can go really bad. Two minutes from now. For mission manager Jennifer Trosper, things became almost unbearable when they lost contact just after landing. So there was 10 minutes of waiting and waiting and you can see the looks on people's faces like we need to hear the signal. This time we're approximately 10 minutes after landing. The vehicle should have rolled to a stop by now. The deep space network stations at Goldstone and Canberra are still searching for the signal. Okay, right off the bat, can I get your uh, equipment status and uh, weather conditions? At this time, equipment status is all green and... The night of the landing, there was a keen, if unspoken, competition to detect rover signal first between the space trackers at Goldstone, California and the team at Tidbin Billa, led by Len Ricardo. Everybody's dead silent. It's, it's, everybody's virtually holding their breath, I guess, just hoping that everything's all right. Every time we lock up a carrier or lock up a spacecraft, the first thing we see is the actual carrier. So that's the signal? Mm. So you're really looking for the heartbeat, aren't you? Yes, that's what it was. One way Doppler and the XR bark display. The nerve wracking seconds ticked by. We have just passed one minute to atmospheric entry. And then a breakthrough. Roger, this time we've got an ADL signal from Spirit. See ya. There it is. We're on Mars, everybody. We have a very strong signal. Now, is it true we were the first to get it? Uh, that, that's debatable. <laughs> oh, come on. I mean, did we, were we not the first to uh, pick up on that belief? We believe that we were. But, um, is somebody disagreeing with you? No, no, nobody's challenging it, but we, we think that we got it something like 11 seconds earlier than, than the others. But. Our deep space network is in Canberra and we are dependent upon it, so all the transmissions that you see uh, from Spirit and Opportunity all come by way of Canberra. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> so that is a vital cog in your, your wheel. Very large. This is a big night for NASA. We're back. To the Mars Exploration Rover team, the best in the world. NASA boss Sean O'Keefe was on a high. But just a few days later, we'll his supreme leader was about to command he aim higher. Human missions to Mars and to worlds beyond. We do not know where this journey will end, yet we know this. Human beings are headed into the cosmos. George Bush isn't the first US president to reach for the stars. Back in 1961, President Kennedy was keen to get to the moon, saying we do these things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. What he should have also said is they're incredibly expensive. George Bush Sr. had grand Martian plans when he was in office 15 years ago. And at the time, it was going to cost something like $400 billion. Well, now his son wants to achieve the same goal, but on a whole lot less. 
It's one small step for man. Just think of it, sending an astronaut to Mars 150 times further away than our moon. That's a round trip of more than a year. Your mission is to get man to Mars, and you've accepted that mission. Do you really think you can do it? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's certainly going to be a challenge. Uh, the effects on human beings as a consequence of long-duration spaceflight, physiological breakdown and, and uh, degeneration of muscle mass and bone mass, radiation exposure, uh, all those factors are uh, not yet solved. And we will not go and do that until we have solved them. And part of it turns on our capacity to get anywhere quickly. As it stands, NASA propels spaceships at the same pace it's done for 40 years. And $12 billion has been earmarked to develop a new ship that can shoot humans to Mars. A huge sum, but way short of the $600 billion realistically required, according to long-term NASA critic Greg Easterbrook. Everyone in NASA knows how totally unrealistic the vision that President Bush laid out is, only for money reasons, uh, if not technical ones. Uh, but NASA has, has a long-standing strategy of telling the White House anything it wants to hear and asking for whatever amount of money it can get. Do you think Mars is worth the effort? Not at $600 billion. Uh, certainly unmanned probes will cost 1% at maximum of the cost of sending people to Mars. And so I'd be enthusiastic about future unmanned probes of Mars, but with current technology, for people to go there is a total waste of everyone's money. How much is it going to cost? Don't know. I mean, it's, it is Because that's a, the big question, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a question that, that is uh, elusive in terms of its answer because it presumes that you know what the solution is. It's like asking a, uh, a scientist when they walk into the laboratory, what are you going to discover today? This is not a race, it's a journey. It's not a race? It is not a race, it is a journey. Is there anybody out there? Exploration is a basic human instinct. The urge to keep peeping over the horizon means today, space is the last frontier. Is there anybody out there? So it's probably inevitable that one day man will make it to Mars. If we do, Tidbin Biller will of course be along for the ride. Is there anybody out there? Do you think life is out there? Of course it is. What form it is, I don't know. Is there a parallel world to our own? Possibly. Is there another Liz Hayes? Yeah, it's probably another Liz Hayes. No. <laughs> <laughs>Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.